Imagine being in a room full of people just like you. Fleet owners, brokers, drivers, service providers, entrepreneurs, investors, and all these people have one thing in common. They're all a part of the transportation and logistics industry. See, in many ways, we're just like family. Sometimes we agree, <laughs> most times we don't. But we all understand that in order to win, we have to work together. My name is Rob Mel Watley, and I'm the founder and host of the Truck and Hustle podcast. And I'm inviting you to our second annual Freight Fest conference on September 28th through October 1st at the Hilton Americas in Houston, Texas. Learn, explore profitable transportation niches like intermodal, oil and gas, heavy haul, warehousing, freight forwarding, and many more. This may be your chance to pivot in your business and your opportunity to grow. Connect. Meet your next business partner, or maybe connect with a direct customer that you've been looking for. Your network is your net worth, and they're all here. Make more money. We understand the transportation and logistics industry has been tough over the past year, but many experts say we've reached the bottom, and as things begin to turn around, you have to have a plan and a strategy to execute for the upcoming year. We've got you. Freight Fest 2023 is here. So get your tickets and join myself, the Truck and Hustle team, and many, many more. If you're in this thing till the wheels fall off, Houston is the place to be. And oh yeah, if you smell something burning, it's only your desire. Let's go. <laughs> At the beginning, there was no business plan. The business plan was to make it to the next day. I was only 24 years old. I wasn't business mature to know what it really took. I was just kind of winging it every day. It all came down to structure. Like if we make it, we have to make sure that our foundation is strong. Mm. I always knew in the back of my head that whatever goes up has to come down. For example, I, I hear the news like a lot of companies are not making it throughout this time, uh, this era of trucking that, that is now. Um, and it's because you grew too fast. I know growing could be uh, thought of in a positive way, but growing too fast in business can bring a lot of issues. Logistics is the beginning and the end of things. We drive the market. So if that container that was going to Carson had something as simple as pens that used to cost a buck at the 99 cent store, they're not gonna cost a dollar anymore. Right, and who does it hurt at the end? In the it end hurts day, us. It hurts us. Hi, my name is Bianca and I'm the CEO of Jaspem Truckline and you're now watching Truck and Hustle. Hustle fam, hustle fam, we are back with another amazing episode, and I am here recording live from, are we in Compton or Los Angeles? Which one is it? We're in LA. We're in LA. But we'll say we're in Compton, because if you cross the street, you're in Compton. You're in Compton or across the <laughs> it's street. It's one of those things. Okay, so we're from the East Coast. You know, they, there's a song by Too Short that goes, New York is just like Compton. You ever heard that song before? No, I actually haven't. Yeah, it's a pretty But cool I could song. see that. I've and, been to New York. And he said, he basically says like, everywhere is just like Compton. He's like, Los, he's like uh, San Antonio <laughs> is just... Just like I Compton. Compton. <laughs> Remember that song, Quick? Yeah yeah, 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 That was too short, right? Nah, that was... Um, DJ Quick. Yeah. Was it DJ Quick? Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. All right, we're getting off track. Anyway, <laughs> let's, let's, let's get back into it. So we are here um, with Miss Bianca Cal Cal Calanche. 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 Uh, CEO of Jasper Truck Lines. You guys are a, you specialize in drayage? Correct. Intermodal? Correct. But you do some other things as well, warehousing and so forth? Right? Yeah, yeah. So we, we're kind of, we are, uh, we started as a drayage carrier um, back in 2015. Ooh, been a while, 2015. Mm. Um, and so our main, our main uh, uh, niche is, is drayage. Okay. Um, the warehousing side is quite new. We've been doing it for three and a half years now. Okay. Um, and when I say new, it's like we, three and a half years. I, I had a client um, just need a transload service. And we had a we used to have a yard in Carson that had like a dock. And I remember I was like, oh, let's just do it. Like, let's <laughs> right. whatever. It's money. You know what I mean? And so I remember we, we said, yeah, we'll do it. We have, we, you know, we have a warehouse or whatever. We'll get it done. It was just an easy cross dock. And what that means is just 
um, you park the container, you park the dry van, it just goes from the container to the dry van immediately as soon as the container gets there. Yeah. So um, I remember um, it was me, my sister, uh, my dispatcher, um, and two of my account guys that we were transloading the the uh, the merchandise ourselves. <laughs> and that's where, it, literally, that's, that's where, where it started. got started. No like, doubt. we were like, okay, like. You built it out of necessity. I was like, oh, yeah, I was like, okay, I could do this for this client. I don't have anywhere to do it now, but I could definitely, you know, in the future do that. So we would do like one-offs where we would do it on the weekend and, you know, me and my sister and my dad and because we're a family-owned company. We would yeah. just transload it ourselves um, at the time. But, you know, now we definitely ventured into this new side of it um, where we're doing not only warehouse, but we're um, uh, just got our, you know, our feet wet with uh, brokering. Mm. So we're doing dry van and LTL right okay. now. Okay, all mm -hmm. right. So started in 2015, right? 2015. Almost 10 years ago. Almost 10 years Congratulations ago, Congratulations yeah. coming up on that decade in business. Yes, <laughs> I know. Um, my dad always said, if we can make it to 10 years, That's right. you know what I mean? We might, we, we might, might not. just make it. Yeah, we might, might, might just, just make have it. something Yeah, here, exactly. For sure. All right, so let's talk a little bit about, about your, your background. Uh, you grew up, born, raised in? No, actually, so I grew up, um, I, grew, I grew up here in Compton, actually. Okay. Um, but I was born in Guatemala. So I'm actually a dreamer. So I um I was brought here at the age of two, um, and I've never left. Mm. Um, so yeah, definitely. Um, when was, you say a dreamer, what's that? I never heard that term. Before. Um, basically, um, when Barack Obama was uh, president, he created this form of not giving uh, these kids that were brought here uh, undocumented papers necessarily, but just an opportunity to work. Okay. So he gave them, um, you know, an employee verification card where they can go and apply and, and work legally, um, gave them a social security so they could have credit and stuff like that. So I'm actually part of that program still. Mm. Yeah. From Barack Obama? Yeah. He's the one that... Um, How long ago was Barack Obama in office? Oh, eight. Oh, eight. Was it that long ago? I feel like it was, yeah. it was like four years ago. It was that long ago? Okay, so. Be because when, he created that, he's my guy, bro. He's, he's your, okay, so hold on. So how old were you when that happened? Oh, eight. Um, I graduated high school, oh, nine. So I was 17. You were 17. Yeah. So you came over as a result of that program? No, no, so I you, came you here came when two. I was two. All right, yeah, yeah, I was explain two to years me. I, I missed yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so my parents came here first, left me over there with my grandma at the time. Um, and, you know, they. my mom couldn't live without her baby. I understand, like, a, you know, I'm not a mother myself, but I could only imagine what right. that felt like. Um, and she um, started her uh, immigration process here and actually got... Um, uh, paperwork at the time so she went back for me um it's kind of a crazy story i don't know if i, if I should stay say it but yeah, my mom should. used to my mom used to <laughs> my mom used to clean houses okay. in beverly hills okay so she used to take the bus every day um you know to clean this lady's house and every day she she would cry on the bus like because mm. she missed me you know what i mean um and then this one time, this lady that was sitting across from her was like, like, like she sat next to her. And she's like, are you OK? Like, why are you crying? She's like, and then she kind of just like told her everything like, oh, like me and my husband came here and, you know, we're living in like this, you know, one bedroom apartment. And my my child is still over there. She's only one years old at the time I was. Um, and she's like and she told her where where I was at. And it turns out that she had family just down the block from my grandma's house. Got you. And she also had a little girl that was my same age that was mm, born here. Okay. Here comes the crazy part. So she was like, why don't you use her passport to bring her back? Mm. And this was in 90, what, well, 92. Okay. So um, the crazy story is that my mom was crazy enough, mother's love, I guess, right, um, to say yes. She's like, she's like, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. Like, so what she did was that my grandma, my, my great grandma, her grandma had just passed away, um, maybe like a month before she met the lady. And, um, and so she filed for this thing in immigration where you could go see a loved one if they passed away. Mm. Um, so she filed for all that. And because she had just passed away, she was able to legally fly to Guatemala and come back. So she actually took the little girl with her. And, I, and before that happened, like she called my grandma and she's like, OK, this is what's going to happen. So Bianca is going to have to learn a different name 
like at the time I was already speaking. So if someone asked me for my name, I wasn't going to say, you know, someone else's right, name. Right, right, right. And so my aunts over there trained me to learn a new new name, to say if the immigration officer asked me right. anything, like that I was already trained to say what my name was, how old I was, who my mom was, all that stuff. Um, and the little girl, I remember my mom telling me the story, the little girl had curly hair, like really, like a lot of curly hair. And at the time, it, it's crazy because now I have curly hair, but at the time I had really straight hair. And then after puberty, kind of change on me but they had to curl my hair and everything wow and then, that is crazy. i know and so my mom you know went and then um she always tells me the story how nervous she was because obviously you for know, sure if you, you get caught it's it's really bad yeah um but she took the little girl with her and the little girl stayed at her grandparents house and she actually came back by um by uh by car because okay. she, her grandparents were actually going to come already on a trip like that. So it ended up working out. And I ended up flying back with my mom. Okay. But my mom told me that she definitely gave me some Benadryl <laughs> to knock me out. <laughs> right. And that's exactly what happened. And right. then um, I landed and, you know, my dad went to pick us up and, and yeah. Wow. And that's how I got here. What a story. I know. You made it. I made it. You made it. You and, made it. <laughs> and then, yeah. And so um, so then when Brock was in office, uh, there are a lot of kids like me, a, no, a lot of adults now like me, um, that, you know, I had friends who would work in downtown LA for cash money and they would pay them really bad, really bad because you have no papers, no nothing. So you're just trying to grind, trying to make a living, but it's hard when you don't have those opportunities to actually, you know, want to do something with your life other than, you know, the typical job where it is washing dishes, you know, in a restaurant or working in what we call, um, you know, the downtown callejones in Spanish, um, where people are just, you know, selling stuff and all, all that kind of stuff. It just, it just sucks because I actually met people that were doing that. And then after Barack Obama passed that, you know, they actually were able to get a job with benefits and all that good stuff that, you know, mm. everybody else gets to benefit from. Got it. Got it. Wow. That's an incredible yeah. story, man. So that's my story. Um, but I mean, here we are. I mean, I'm very grateful for the way things have unfolded for me. Um, even in the in the eye of adversity, I feel like I've always been blessed. Yeah. Why? I don't know. I just try to stay good. So it keeps <laughs> happening. <laughs> Got good karma, right? Yeah, good karma. How, how were you? Uh, where did you go to uh, high school? I went to Narbonne High School, graduated 09. Um, I, there's this high school here. Uh, it's not in Compton, but it's um, next to Compton called Lock High. So I, I actually had to go there. But there's just so many fights. It's just bad school, bad rep. Like yeah. they even closed it down um, because they just no kids weren't getting good grades there. So my my mom at the time, my dad had another trucking company mm -hmm. in Wilmington, which is very close to the ports. OK. And so my mom ended up finding a school um, near that area where it's a lot nicer. And um, I was able to go there because I had really good grades in middle school. So they accepted me to go there. So. Okay. I was I was raised in Compton, but I always say that I was never here mm -hmm. because all my like high school era when you're growing up and kind of making all those decisions about your life um, were somewhere else. Got it. Um, so I, that helped me a lot, to be honest, because I'm not trying to give Compton a bad rep. I love Compton, <laughs> um, but there is a lot of adversity here. Yeah. For sure. um, especially um, with when you're already in high school and you think you know it all. You know what I mean? And it doesn't help, right? And it doesn't help. The peer, it doesn't, the, peer <laughs> the peer pressure doesn't help for, for sure. sure. No doubt. So aside from academics, so you said you were you're pretty smart. You got good grades. Yeah, I was always really, really good at school, to yeah, be honest. For sure. Um, were you an uh, athlete as well? Did you do any yeah, sports? Yeah, um, I did soccer most of my life growing up. Um, and then uh, I did a little of it at Cal State Long Beach. But other than that, that's kind of where it ended. Got I, it. you know. I didn't I I didn't see myself becoming like a professional athlete or anything like that. I always saw myself actually I always saw myself in the medical field and I did graduate with a bio uh chem degree. Degree. Okay, yeah. so where'd you go to college? I went to Cal State Long Beach, okay. um which is just down the way and then after you had that a scholarship? 
Uh, no, I, okay. because I don't have papers or didn't have papers at the time, I don't, I didn't qualify for any, um, government help. Yeah. So I did get a few scholarships, private scholarships, um, from businesses that, you know, support kids like that and stuff. But, um, I just paid my way through. I would work during the day and go to school at night. Okay. And then after I graduated, I did my master's at UCLA. And then shortly after we started this company. Got it. What were you doing for work the, 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 on the side while you were going to school? I was actually working at Felix Chevrolet, which is a, a really famous dealership in downtown L.A. Okay. Um, I was working there during the day um, and I actually worked there throughout my whole college career. Um, and then when I my last year at UCLA, I started doing sales at T-Mobile. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Got it. All good. All right. So you said you had a, good, a degree in biochemistry? What yeah, biochemistry. It? That sounds like it's hard. It was. It was hard. Um, my plan with that was to take the MCATs mm -hmm. um, or just do, uh, you could work for private companies um, that need a lot of um, lab help, basically a lot of um, testing. Yeah. Um, so, and they make really good money right off of, uh, school. You, you be a yeah, right? exactly. So, um, so I was, you know, trying to go into that or, or even go into the, the, going into the pharmaceutical route. Um, but I remember a, the semester before graduating, um, college, my dad approached me. So a little background story on my dad, he yeah. had two businesses before he started this one. Okay. Um, he, um, but both had failed. The first one failed because, um, they were, it was a trucking business as well, but they were flipping houses at the time mm. and they had flipped one house and was, they were very successful. And then, uh, because the first business was a partnership within, um, I think it was about six or seven guys. Um, everybody was kind of putting in like money to get this started. Right. So when they flipped the, the, the first house, they, um, they put it under a partner's name Okay. and then, you know, they fixed it up, flipped it and, and sold it and it went really well. And then they were like, wait, let's do it again. That was, that wasn't too hard. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and they bought the house next to my dad's house here, actually just down the way. Okay. Um, and they, and they bought it under my dad's name cause it was another partner's turn to do it. And he bought it, they flipped it. And then the house market crashed in 2008 oh, 2008 yep and it sat there for three four months and so not not only that but then um one of the partners were like oh i'll rent it you know i'll rent it while you know we're trying to sell it and then six months later my dad gets like a foreclosure notice the guy wasn't paying the rent oh wow and now he owed like over eight months of rent plus his own mortgage yeah plus the business you know was the just truck, starting off business, exactly right? so he's taking like money from the trucking business and investing in real estate yeah correct but the real estate plummeted yes and so they had to he had to file bankruptcy they closed you know and and they didn't close the business actually that business is still running but he just exited himself out because there was just you know a lot of drama with the partners um yeah. and then after that he started another business called blessing freight corp which was just dry van so it was just dry van from um, locations here and he would actually go all the way up to New Jersey. Okay. Yeah. And, um, that was doing well, but one winter, one of his drivers had a really bad accident in Utah and, um, because of the weather and he had to be helicoptered out of the truck. Oh, wow. And he was in the hospital for about two months and my dad had to like fly out his family and it was, it wasn't, it wasn't good. Um, thankfully he's, he's, he, he was okay. Yeah. Okay. The driver. And, um, because of the extensiveness of what it cost, the insurance paid for everything, but he wasn't able to get insurance get anymore. anymore. So he had to close down that company. And that was Blessing that, Freight Corp? That was, yeah, that was Blessing Freight Corp. Got it. Um, and I wasn't in, involved in that one. I was involved in the first one. I would go after school and invoice for him and do little things like that. Um, but then right before graduating, he approached me and he's like, I need to try one more time because he's such a, he's such a, uh, he's such a businessman. Yeah. Um, he doesn't like to work for anybody. He's always been an owner operator himself. Um, ever since like I was little, he's been driving trucks. Yeah. Um, and even in his hometown, he, 
all his stuff was his own business fishing right. i don't know he you know i had watermelon crop i don't he's like he did it <laughs> all real uh, yeah real Serial yeah entrepreneur yeah so he approached me he's like let's try it but let's try it together like yeah. your head my head and let's see if we can make this work and i wasn't too i can imagine like that wasn't that wasn't in my plans he, he derailed your whole path yeah but there's something about i don't know if it's because i'm the firstborn or 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 is it my own personality but i just couldn't say no to my dad you know what i mean especially because i know what he's been through and i it i didn't know anything about the trucking industry but i've always been very entrepreneur myself like even through high school i was doing side gigs to get money selling things um i remember even in, in middle school i would sell candies and stuff just so I could get those new K-Swiss, you know, because my parents <laughs> never gave us anything. You right. know, we didn't have allowance. We didn't have money for cool shoes or anything like that. Yeah. So um, so I've, I've always had that side of it. And business has always actually been a passion of mine, but I never pursued it because I was just so, so good at math and science where it just came natural to me to go that to that course. Mm. Uh, but now looking back at it, it's the best decision I could have made because I really enjoy what I do. Right. Um, and I don't know if I would have enjoyed this in the same level if I would have, you know, gone with what I graduated as. Yeah, for sure. It, it's funny, it, but I guess it happens it to out. a lot of people. Yeah, for sure. And and, and a, an interesting thing is he saw something in you. He was like, let's put our two heads together, right? Yeah. I, I have this trucking knowledge. How, how, how big was his trucking company? How big did he grow him before you guys started Jasmine? Like- Zero. Small. No, nothing. He had nothing. Oh, he didn't have any. No, truck. he had his own truck, which was his one. one. Okay. And the the when he had Blessing Freight, he had to sell Got the it. two other trucks that he had. One was totaled, and then the other one he had to sell because um, at at that time he had um, and family that invested in in the company. Yeah. And the thing is that with Hispanics. It's just like they don't understand what investment is. They yeah. just know they put money in and they need to receive something back. <laughs> and that never happened yeah. because, you know, so he felt bad. He didn't want any, you know, type of um, drama within the family. So he started just working himself with his own truck to pay everybody back. Yeah. And and some, you yeah. know what I mean? So when when we started Jasper and we had nothing. Start from scratch. Yeah. He had his one truck. He was the driver. My aunt, um, she um, had a background in dispatching. So she was actually working as a dispatcher for another company and dispatching him on the side because there was this one client that they had found that needed help doing one or two containers a day. Right. So it wasn't a lot of um, volume um, and it was just him. Got it. Got so it. when I came in, they had one truck and my aunt was dispatching on the side. Okay. How did you approach the industry? Because now this is a brand new industry to you. You know nothing about it. What did you do to, to number one, educate yourself on what you were getting yourself into? And what was your initial role? Like, how did you get started yeah. adding value to the company? So I feel like I started out very naive. Um, I didn't know the depth of what this industry has to offer. And I started off like one thing at a time. Um, when I came in, they were doing uh, that, that account and I think one more that they had hired an owner operator to do. Um, and they, our office was at my aunt's apartment <laughs> in her kitchen. Right. Um, and so when I came in, there was just a lot of invoices that hadn't been done. Um, a lot of money that hadn't been collected. Um, my dad's insurance was up. I think, you know, that was like a $3,000 payment for, you know, that, you know, for the down payment. And there's just a lot of things, uh, cleric, clerical work that hadn't been done. Right. So that's how I started with them. I was like, okay, I'll get you guys on track. I'll invoice everything. Um, and I'll, you know, start checking to see like who owes us money. And so I started in that, in the accounting side first, mm -hmm. um, because my aunt was dispatching. So there was no need for me to, you know, do that yet because right. it did happen. I ended up learning how to dispatch and all that, but I ended up just fixing that part first. Um, because I think that uh, when people start a business, they don't realize how important having a good accounting system is. Mm. If the money isn't flowing in, you can't pay your rent, 
you can't pay bills, you can't pay employees. Um, there's no uh, uh, cash flow doing this. You know what I mean? That's right. Um, so that's one of the first lessons that I learned. Like, oh, we need to get our accounting stuff going. Together. Um, or we're not going to survive another month, um, you know, without having the money to pay for the people that are doing the work for you. That's right. That's right. Um, so after, you know, learning that side, I think that that taught me a lot um, on that side. But then um, we needed work and we needed uh, more drivers and we didn't have money to buy trucks. So we, you know, what I started doing was I, I um, started putting um, first I got our company actually email handles. So we weren't like, <laughs> it wasn't like Jaspin at yahoo.com. Right, you know right, what I mean? So right. I got us set up to actually have like a, like an actual email with our name. And, um, and I got us on Google. So if people like searched us, you know, they, they could find our name locally based. Yeah. Um, and I just started reaching out. I remember Googling like the top 20 brokers logistic brokers and i printed out a list and i was just going one by one emailing them calling them to see if they could give us work mm -hmm. and that's really how it started um it. i ended up uh clicking with like three companies that that are still working with us um nolan transportation which now they're pretty big um xpo which they're not here anymore now they're stg here and um and then just a local little company called d well which was nearby okay um and they started providing more work for us. So that's when I started to learn how to charge, uh, how to charge a rate, which I didn't even know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Um, I knew how to get them in the door, but then how do I, I was like, how do I sell them what we're, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. I didn't, I had no idea what, what, how to break down, you know, a chassis charge, uh, you know, the, the, the line haul and fuel, all that stuff. So actually all that I was taught by my aunt. Because okay. she had been in the industry for a long time. So she was actually a main piece that helped me get to where I am now. Because okay. if she wasn't there, I don't know how I would have done it. <laughs> like, I, I I didn't know anything about the industry at, at the time. Got it. So, yeah. Got it. Shout out to Nolan Transportation, Kevin Nolan. That's another friend of the show. He, oh, really? He, he's been on the show. Yeah, Him we've been working cousin, with- cousin, Kevin we've... Uh, uh, Fritz, Fritz Owens. Oh, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so, all right, cool. So, yeah, so so I want to unpack that a little bit. So when you guys got started, uh, you had you had a truck, and did you have a trailer? No, no, no trailer. trailer. We were just doing um, drayage work. Just doing the drayage. cool thing about drayage yep. is that you don't need a trailer. You just go pick up from the port, um, and pull chassis was really big at the time. So you just we just we ended up getting set up with um, all of the chassis providers that were at the terminal. And um, the main challenge was just finding clients, you know what I mean, that could give us work to go and pick up the, the, the boxes from the port and deliver them to local warehouses. Got it. So you connect with these three original brokers who kind of set you guys up to get started. Mm -hmm. um, did you make those deals? Yes, I did. How, how did you go about making those deals? Just kind of were you transparent with them? You let them know like, hey, I'm new to this industry. I, like, some, tell me about that. Yeah, actually, I did. Um, I feel like the thing that has always stuck with me even until now is that Jasmine's very transparent. Um, there's no need, you know what I mean? Um, and I think that a lot of it has to do more with the person that's on the other side of the phone. Um, if they like you, they're gonna like you for who you are, even if you have one truck. That's right. Um, and I learned very quickly that it's better to have a really good partner than 10 bad ones. Um, and what I mean by that is that I've gone through, um, clients that don't pay on time. The pressure is just ridiculous where they just send you 10, 12 loads and they expect you to get them done the next day. You know, you're just kind of like a machine to them. Right. Um, versus a really good partner. Um, you'll have a conversation with them and you'll know about their family and you'll know about what they like and what they don't. And when it comes down to business, business is done. Uh, I would say a more, I don't want to call it friendly way, but just a more human to human way. Yeah. Um, where in a partnership, you talk about your expectations. What can Jasmine do? What they, what we can't, because we can't do it all. You know what I mean? Um, and that way we could find lanes that actually work 
with us and we don't come out looking bad to the client because we didn't have enough availability or we lied about you know how many trucks we actually have and all that stuff so i feel like that was something that um was set up from the beginning even with nolan transportation i remember i was like we have three trucks you know what i mean if there's a little lane where you have maybe you know two a day or whatever the situation is and they they helped me out a lot um to get started in in just a few lanes and you know at the time so i feel like the way i did those deals was truly um based on my sales background where it was just let me get to know the person let me get let me get the person to like me and then maybe they'll give me something that can benefit me and my company that's right what what was the and it was still early so what was the business plan did, did you guys have a plan did you know where you what was your north star where was the company going or you just kind of winging it every day no business plan <laughs> i'm not gonna lie to you at the beginning there was no business plan the business plan was to make it to the next day um I had no knowledge how to run a business, what it what it really takes to plan and to have goals. Um, I was only 24 years old um, and I feel like I wasn't uh, business mature to know what it really took. Um, I was just kind of winging it every day. And when people, I, I always, um, find myself on YouTube, uh, you know, listening to other people interview about how they made it and all this stuff. And they always say, I never, I I didn't know what I was doing. Like I could relate to that. (laughs) I didn't know what I was doing. I was, I just knew that the plan was that we needed to make it to the next day, that we wanted more trucks, that we wanted to grow our fleet, how I was going to do that. I didn't know. I was just putting one foot in front of the other. Like Kobe said, you know what I mean? Um, that people tend to think, well, I need to be at this level at this time or at this level at this time. And you're looking to your left, you're looking to your right, and you're seeing all these people pass right by you. Um, but sometimes it's not all about that. It's, yeah, I think that if I look back, I wouldn't change anything um, because I took it step by step. Mm. Where, okay, we have three trucks now, uh, we have enough money to add another one, let's do it. Yeah. And um, the goal was just to make sure that, at least for me, was that the partnerships that I had created weren't going anywhere. Because I knew that that's what was feeding us. We are here live at OTR Solutions HQ. I'm here with my partner, Jonathan. Man, listen, factoring is an integral part of the transportation industry. Why is factoring important? Absolutely, Ramel. In this economy, in this market, cash flow is king. Cash flow is the key to growth. If you have a young trucking company or if you've been in the industry for years and you want to take that business to the next level, we're absolutely a company that can help. So I hope you'll give us a call today. Let us know what we can do to help you out. Get the rest and roll with the best. Let's go. Now, the the lanes that you're running at this point, they're all intermodal, like drage lanes? Yeah, they're all drage lanes. Okay. Got it. So tell me about how you start when things start kind of clicking, you start growing, you started with three. Tell me about how the business advances and starts to grow. I think that once everything started to click, um, it all came down to structure. Um, Because when we only had uh, three trucks, the main um, issue was that we didn't have um, someone in accounting or someone doing night dispatch or day dispatch. Um, We were doing it all. I was, um, my aunt was day dispatching, I was night dispatching, but I was also invoicing during the day and doing sales calls during the day. So like we were just doing it all. Um, And as we started to grow, I was like, oh, I can't do it all. Like I can't invoice 20 invoices in one day, talk to the client, dispatch at night. Like I need to sleep at some point. Um, So I feel like as we started to grow, I really thought about what type of structure I wanted in the company and that's when I started to think about, okay, like if we make it, we have to make sure that our foundation is strong Mm. and that we start adding people that are going to actually help us grow um, instead of causing, you know, more issues that I could be causing myself to try to do everything by myself. Yeah. Um, So we started to look for people that actually brought talent to the team where if I had to be pulled to do something, I wasn't worried in the back of my head, is it gonna get done? Is someone gonna actually catch the ball and you know go all the way? Um, and that took me some time to learn because I thought 
that I could do it all myself, but you really can't. <laughs> you need a team. You need you need a, a good team in order to go through the next levels that most businesses go through. For sure. Tell me about adding those pieces because there's probably a lot of people watching that are in your in that spot right now, right? What? How did you go about adding those pieces? What was the first pieces that you added, you know, to the team to kind of bring things together? Can you just so the on the that? first. The first two things that, that the first two people that we added were actually uh, actual day dispatcher. Um, so he could help us with all the movements during the day. And I wouldn't have to do that um, myself or my aunt. And then we added accounting. OK, so I would go back to accounting because <laughs> that was the one thing we actually added two people to accounting um, because we needed a good flow. Um, as soon as that that load was done, so to have someone invoice it and send it out, so the money wasn't sitting there, because when money's sitting there on that's not on paper yet, that the client doesn't physically have, and that you can charge, that's another week that you could have already had that money. Yeah. So um, so we definitely started to add uh, those little pieces in um, as we grew, and then as I grew, I I, I started to add managers. Um, and to ha have other people in charge and actually delegate certain things um, because I found myself that I just didn't have time for it all. Yeah, yeah. driver managers and or just like operational managers? We have operational managers. We have warehouse managers. We have accounting managers. Right. Um, so we have like a good set of managers that just direct every department that we have um, to make sure that everything's flowing. Okay. Got it. So you continue to grow in the intermodal drainage lane. So that becomes like your thing. That becomes your niche. That becomes the plan. Yes. Right. Tell me about how you start to scale. Are you adding your own trucks? Are you looking at owner operators? Are you leasing guys on? Tell me about how you thought about that and how you got into whatever direction you went into. Yeah. So um, because we didn't have enough capital at the time, buying a truck was, you know, luxury. Um, and we didn't want to get into a lot of debt so early. Um, so what we ended up doing is we ended up just hiring owner operators. Um, and then the trucks that we were um, buying, we were uh, leasing, not leasing them, but selling them to drivers that wanted to become owner operators. Got it. Um, my dad was like, oh, I saw this company did that, you know, and it really helps manage your your expenses because now you have a guy that's going to, you know, um, buy this truck from you in the next two years right. and he's paying it off and working for you at the same time. Right. So we actually did that for half half of the half of the years we've been open okay. for the first four years. That's what we were doing. So we were buying trucks, selling them uh, to drivers that wanted to become owner operators and then um after they because they were we were always do like a two-year contract okay where it was a used truck you'd pay it off in two years we'd help you with you know getting diesel getting the permits doing the if the everything that comes along with um owning a truck yeah and you know kind of teach you to do all that and then two years after they'd be done paying it and they'd still stay with me and work with me Got so it. that was the um the game plan we had okay and then um what i started to notice is that unfortunately when you do have owner operators you need to have a bigger margin of profit because you whatever the line haul and fuel cost you have to give that to the owner operator you have to give 70 percent of that to the owner operator because it's their own equipment their own diesel um so your profit margin becomes smaller and, and smaller yeah um, what, what, what profit margin were you running at that time? I think we were doing at the, in the good old days, <laughs> um, I think it was like 20, 25%. Okay. Um, but I remember in, I feel like in 2017, 2018, there was kind of not a decline in imports, but there was kind of like a tight nudge on rates. Um, and in order for me to be more competitive and get set lanes where I'm like, okay, this, 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 um, this company's give, gonna give me, you know, thirty loads a week to go to this location all the time. I couldn't be competitive, yeah, um, because I had to pay most of it to the owner operator, and then there wasn't enough um, 
profit margin to pay the dispatcher, to pay accounting, um, to pay the rent, to pay all the things that you pay in order to operate. Right. Um, so what we started doing is we started buying trucks and having um, our own our, our own drivers, you know, uh, do the lanes that were just a bit more competitive. Okay. And then in 2019, that's when the whole AB5 thing happened. Mm. Um, and then that's when my dad and I were like, actually, you know what? We should probably continue to do this because they passed it. The thing, the people think that the AB5 law here in California is new. Yeah. But no, that, w that was coming since 2018. We knew about it. Um, it just wasn't... Uh, it didn't go into effect. And just expand on that for people who may not know what the AB5 so law is. So AB5, the AB5 law is basically, in, in short term, you can't hire, um, as a company, you can't hire someone that does the same thing you're doing as an independent contractor uh, or paying them 1099. Um, if, if you're a carrier and you hire another carrier, you're uh, violating the law already. So... In order for us not to do that, we have to hire these people as W-2 employees. Right. Um, so that law came into effect in 20... I, I don't know if it was 2018, 2019. I just remember it was right before COVID. So then when COVID happened, it was supposed to go into effect, I think, 2020 or something like that. And then um, it went into, um, I think, I don't remember what group it was that um, basically... Uh, not sued them, but when, when they're trying to challenge it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they, they had put a stop to it for like six to eight months until they, they determined whether they were going to move, um, forward. move forward or not. And then COVID happened. Yeah. <laughs> so perfect storm. Yeah. Perfect storm. <laughs> so then we were able to, you know, keep the owner operators and, and continue to add actual trucks to our fleet because we knew it was coming no matter what. So yeah. we didn't want to be we wouldn't we didn't want that to be thrown in our face where we weren't going to be able to operate because we were just an owner operator based company. Mm, got you. So so you guys were transitioning that way anyway before it actually happened. Yeah. And it, because it was good for your bottom line. Yes, because at the end, I was able to be more competitive with the lanes that I wanted to win if we kept everything in house. Got it. Got it. All right. So we fast forward to around COVID. T tell me when things really start to explode for you guys or, or if there's any moment where um, the trajectory just like shot up. Like, just give me an idea. What Definitely like. COVID times. OK. Definitely COVID times. Um, before COVID, I think we ended I think we ended the year with about 15 trucks um, and we were kind of scaling up little by little. Um, but during COVID times, the, the, um, the growth that the whole country had in, in terms of spending <laughs> yeah. was insane. So there was such a demand for, um, imports coming out, um, of the port. And we found ourselves in this era of trucking here in Southern California, where rates were doubling like crazy, um, there were, you know, containers just dwelling out on the vessel in, in the ocean, not being able to dock because there's just no room. Right. Um, and because there was no room, you had a bunch of empties out on the street. Like, I remember driving around and I would see a container parked in every street um, because there was no room to put the empties because the terminals had no room for the empties to come to right. get brought in. Right. So obviously supply and demand. Right. Um, I'll, the prices for rates went up. Um, I mean, it was a good time to be in trucking. I had a friend start a trucking company during COVID and they grew as fast as it took me four years to grow. <laughs> no, right. I'm serious. Right, like right, right. it was crazy. Like yeah. they they were from, you know, one truck to 10 trucks. And I'm like, dude, how did you do that? It took me four years to get there. That's right. Um, so we were, you know, we were still very small, but when COVID came around, we definitely took advantage of of the wave and and rode it until we could no more. Got it. What what was that like for you in terms of just like winning at such a high level at that moment like how did you guys deal with that emotionally and how did you you know make sure as a business you didn't get too high yeah so i i feel like i did keep my my feet on the ground when that happened um because i always knew in the back of my head that whatever goes up has to come down um so um i think that 
for example, I, I hear the news, like a lot of companies are not making it throughout this time, uh, this era of trucking that that is now. Um, and it's because you grew too fast. Um, I know growing could be uh, thought of in a positive way, but growing too fast in business can bring a lot of issues. Mm. Um, one issue is that everything that you've made or you're reinvesting, um, and that's great, but if you're reinvesting uh, in a large amount, what happens when the business comes down and you have a lot of trucks that aren't working, for right. example, right. Uh, that, that aren't, you know, if your truck isn't moving, you're not making money. Um, and I felt like a lot of companies did that. For example, the demand was so high um, in terms of just yard space that the, the, the real estate um, lease prices went up like crazy when it used to cost maybe 60 to 70 cents per square foot to lease um, commercial land. Um, it went from that to close to, you know, $2 and 50 cents. That's triple. Right. So right. a lot of companies went into these long term leases, um, you know, five. I think the shortest lease that you could do on a on a on a on a commercial commercial land is five years. Yeah. So you just got stuck <laughs> with a lease at two dollars and some. And now the, the 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 trucking industry went down and you now how are you going to pay for that? You can't, you know, uh, the 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 sorry, the rates were were driven so low that in COVID times you were able to charge sixty five dollars per container that it got, you know, uh, rented out that space, and now it went from sixty five to thirty bucks. Some companies want, sorry, some uh, uh, companies want twenty five. You know what I mean? And if other people are accepting that price because they're under uh, another lease term, then they can compete now. Right. Right. But you can no longer compete because you're stuck with this really expensive lease that you got during really great times. But the real estate was just so high. So we knew that we did not we didn't even touch real estate at that time. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, we actually ended up getting a yard right when it started to slow down because we were already looking for one. But we just didn't want to commit to a really high price lease without knowing where this was headed. Yeah. There's just and, and your dad had already seen a real estate boom too. Yes, he had. Right. So I'm sure like in the he back of his mind, he's like, I've, I've seen this happen before. Yeah, exactly. So that that really did help us, you know, kind of just again, I think my model has been going like step by step. You know what I mean? Not trying to be oversell us, um, but definitely having goals where we can accomplish them and not think that tomorrow we're not going to have yeah. somewhere to stand. How do you do that? How do you be conservative about your goals? I mean, that's that's an interesting point. Like, because if you see things are going well, the 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 thing that comes out automatically is we want to grow. Let's 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 get yeah. it right. So, how do you stay conservative and make sure? Like, how do you know when it's time to? All right, now we're they were here. Now it's time to do this. Like, how do you look at that? Um, I think I look at it as opportunity. Um, if for a long time, you know, business was stable and we were growing little by little. So every year we'd add two, three trucks, you know, at, at, at that level. Um, and so when COVID happened, things were growing really, really quickly. So I feel like if ever some, if they have, if ever there's a change of weather and it just continuously changes every day, then you should not be making moves that are going to be set in stone. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I think a good way of looking at it is if there's a consistency in something, whether it's three months, whether it's six months, then you know that it's time to make a change in growth. Right. But if every week there is, you know, something either going up or going down like it is now, then, you know, like, OK, let's stay steady and see where the weather takes us. And if there's stability, at least a quarter like if there's just in one quarter, there's somewhat of stability, then you're like, OK, then, you know, this this thing is not going to stay the way the way it is. Got it. Um, so I, I look at it as like a like a weather thing. You know what I mean? I got it. I like that. I like that. You said you rode uh, out uh, COVID until you could no longer ride it. Right. So what does that mean? What was the no longer <laughs> ride COVID? What, what happened? The rate. <laughs> um, thankfully, uh uh, with clients that I was already working with, we didn't increase the rates like crazy. Um, I've always, I'm, I'm so big on, on, um, transparency and honesty. 
Um, the last thing I wanted to do was hurt a partnership because I got greedy. Price gouge. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't think that was fair because a lot of people don't think about this, but if I was charging, and this is a true story, I, I had a, I'm not going to mention names, but I had, I know somebody that was um, doing from the Long Beach ports to Carson, which is about a 12 mile one way. So about a 24 mile round trip was charging about $3,000. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> $3,000. Wow. Um, because the demand was so high, nobody had availability. So Crazy. he had that power. Yeah, yeah. And he used it. Ball was in his court at that time. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I, I never did that because the last thing I wanted to do was to hurt my partners and hurt my own pocket. Because you have to think about in logistics, everything that's coming out of the, the boats are going to end up on shelves and are going to end up in your house. So we're actually, in a way, we are the cause of inflation. Mm. Because, and that's what I meant when, when I said that when I got into this business, I was very naive. It's because I didn't know how things worked. How it impacted And how everything. it impacts everything. Yeah. I mean, logistics is the beginning and the end of things. Um, because we drive the market. So if that container that was going to Carson had something as simple as pens that used to cost a buck at the 99 cent store, they're not going to cost a dollar anymore. Right. And who does it hurt at the end? In the it end hurts it, us. It hurts us. So it, it, it's, um, I have the opportunity to make money and I did, I think in a conservative way where I saw everybody you know, drive up their prices and, and you know, the water kind of went up. Um, but I didn't want to uh, be a jerk to my clients. And then when things didn't, because obviously I just knew this wasn't going to just stay like this. Yeah. Um, I didn't want my clients to leave me because they remembered that I charged them $3,000 to Carson. That's right. I think that, and, and that speaks to what you spoke about, the difference between like partnerships, right? Like having true partnerships, because there's going to be a time when your customer may not need you as much. Yeah. Right. And they yeah. can, they, the ball is now in their court and they can, you know, give you a low price, but they're going to remember that time when you didn't overcharge them. And they're going to say, you know what, let's keep it fair. That's exactly what's happening now. So be, because the market just went down on trucking, um, I have, you know, a lot of partners that could give me a lower price. Um, but because we have that partnership, um, I'm like, hey, can you help me out with, you know, $25 more on the line haul? And $25 make a difference when you're, you know, running, you know, a 30 container a week lane. Um, that adds up really quickly. And that pays for, you know, any little thing, whether it's electricity bill or, you know, uh, the phone bill or whatever. Um, so that's exactly what's happening now where I, I, I depend on my partnerships, just like at one point they depended on me to get you know, the moves done, um, and not overprice. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. I love that. Um, tell me about the operation now, current date. What does it look like? You guys move out of the Long Beach ports. Yeah. Long where Beach. Where you guys kind of, where you do most of your work kind of. Yeah. That. So, um, everything that we do comes out from the Long Beach and LA ports. We do rails as well and Lambridge. Um, but 90% of our work does come out from the LA um, and Long Beach ports. That's what we focus on. Um, and I think that um, at first, I think I wanted to do a lot of everything. I was like, oh, we should, you know, dabble into dry van or, you know, get, you know, buy a little uh, bobtail truck and do LTL and, you know, warehousing. But I feel like um, the fact that we were able to focus on one thing and we, we grew into being really good at it. Yeah. Um, put us in a position to, okay, now we want to do warehousing. Um, and now the partners that I'm doing Drage for, I get offer warehousing and they can trust me because I'm so good at this that they'll know that by adding an, an additional service, we're not adding on so many things that we look like, you know, I, you don't want to do it all, but you also don't want to do it all wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are you still um, like selling like are you are you still actively selling every day or do you just have like customers that you kind yeah, of just work I with? I do. Okay. Um I've never left that side. Um 
I I like selling. Um, I, I I actually enjoy sales. I could tell by the way you lit up when I asked you. You're uh, like, yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, because I, I don't know. I feel like um, that's my strong suit. And I, I do run a lot of different departments, but I do leave time during the week to make sure that, one, I check up on the clients that I do have. Um, but another is that, when you pick up the phone and you're like, hi, my name is Bianca, I run Jaspum Truck Line, and they know that you have some type of power in the company, for some reason, that helps you close the deal. Mm. Because you, I feel like the person on the other side feels like they're dealing with the person in charge. Right. Um, and I do have a sales team. Um, I kicked them out of this room today. Um, <laughs> but um, but I do like to use that little leverage of power um, just because um, I feel like when they work directly with me, they trust me right off the bat. Mm. Um, and it helps us. It helps drive sales. It helps us meet you know, more people and add more clients to our list. Making sure that your compliance is on point is an integral part of any trucking related business. Today, I stopped by my friends over at Fleet Drive 360 to talk about what they're building to make sure that you can run a successful trucking company. And it's everything from the minute you decide you want to hire somebody through maintaining all of your FMCSA compliance documents for ongoing fleet or, or owner operator truck uh, business. You've got a driver hiring and recruiting module where you'll create driver qualification files, import digital documents. You've got a drug and alcohol module where you can schedule pre-employment drug tests and manage an ongoing testing pool. We've got an accident registry so you can keep your mandated accident logs and even schedule follow-up uh, drug testing for post-crash. We've got vehicle maintenance logs so you can not only maintain the compliance status of your vehicles but also upload your work orders and compliance related documents so you're audit ready when they come in. We've got a document repository, fancy words for digital cloud storage of any document that you want, not just necessarily the compliance documents, anything related to your business, post crash videos, performance evaluations. And then finally, you've got the dashboard and the dashboard is the most important part. You can close your eyes and glance at our dashboard, open them, glance at the dashboard and immediately know whether or not you're compliant or not, both on a driver, company and vehicle level. It's one stop shop for all your compliance needs. Do you have sale like sales goals that you're always trying to yes. reach, like targets? How do you how do you t tell me about that? Um, I think that the way I approach it is depending on the market weather. Um, for example, like I said, when COVID happened, we weren't looking for clients, so. Uh, the sales department kind of became um, a customer support more mm. um, when we just had uh, clients calling, hey, can you pick up this empty? Can you pick up this container last minute? So we approached that to gain uh, clients that could trust us to do it um, because we we got really picky with who we were working with mm. um, because there was just so, many de so much demand that you kind of, it was cool. We had never been on that side of the spectrum where you're kind of like, oh, no, not you, but you, I like, come here. <laughs> right, right, you know what right, I mean? Right, right, right. Um, Feels but good. It, feel, it felt good. Um, but, you know, now with the market going down, everybody is looking for clients and everybody has a, a brand new sales team or more salespeople. Um, so I feel like when I set goals, they have to approach whatever it's going on in the market. So right now it's very low. Um, there's not a lot of volume coming into LA yet. Um, but in terms of, in terms of sales, we like to approach it and okay, look, there's not a lot of volume coming in, but we can get one or two clients in the door at least, you know, every quarter. Yeah. And I know that sounds, you know, like a small amount, um, but my guys are cold calling every day, emailing, marketing, and just to get someone to actually have a conversation with you is really hard. Mm. Um, and sales has always been that hard. Yeah. Uh, it's it's not the time, you know, but I feel like it does have a lot to do when when there's not a lot of demand um, and it's just so, so slow that they're not even, they don't even want to hear you out right now. That's right. So you have to, the goals have to be set in terms of, okay, let's try to get one or two clients in the door. 
And let's, you know, we have to get creative. Let's offer something that maybe others aren't offering. Maybe we own our own chassis, so maybe we can offer one day for free just to get them in the door. Right. You know what I mean? Or um, or maybe we can offer, you know, one day of free storage or, you know, we 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 have our own yard. Little things that we can, we have other value adds that could, you know, um, that could be added to to that so we can look more attractive um when when calling somebody yeah. um but sales has definitely gotten really hard this year Got it. um traditionally i think it, this industry is probably the toughest industry for sales just because like to your point it's so hard to just get somebody on the phone yeah there's like three or four gatekeepers before, before you get, you get to, to the, the person that person makes a decision. Making a decision correct and i don't think there's any other industry like that yeah, right? you're it's, right. it's like when you think you got the guy or the girl, it's like, nope, there's somebody else that goes after them. Right. Yeah. And to be honest, I've learned if there is something that if I could go back in time and do things differently, probably the only thing that I would tell my younger self is network network like mm. crazy. Mm. When I came in this industry, I felt like I've never been a shy person, um, but I've I've also um, n I didn't know how to use that plus that I have that I'm not shy and I can just go up to you hey how are you doing and start a conversation right. for my business because now that you know eight years in I wish I would have networked I I wish I would have gone to more events to more um, there's so many things that uh, so many. Um, Oh my gosh, what do you call them? Conferences um, that this industry offers for people to go to. Um, and that really helps your business in just knowing people. And you might bump into somebody or meet somebody at a conference. And, you know, I, I remember my first conference that I went to, um, I went with a coworker of, of mine. We went together and it was lunchtime, so we you know went to go get lunch, and we entered the conference lunchroom, and there's just so many people everywhere, and I felt like a little shy, and I was like, oh my gosh, I kind of want to go sit in that corner table and not talk to anybody, you know what I mean, and kind of right. just eat my food because I've been talking all day. <laughs> um, but then you know the part of me is like, no, go sit, just pick a table, you know the one that maybe looks the friendliest. Um, I usually tend to go towards the older people because they're just nicer mm -hmm. than the younger generation, <laughs> I feel. Um, and then I just start, you know, talking to, to, to them. But it, it is harder to do that once you're in, in the motion of things. Um, yeah. But I would definitely tell my younger self, network, meet people. One person might lead you to another person. Um, that's gatekeeping, you yes, know, yes, the yes. person that, that makes a decision. So I feel like uh, that... That has definitely um, helped me uh, grow these last maybe three years that I've really implemented that for myself because I have personal goals as well. And, and that has been one of them. Just network, network, meet people, talk to people, ask them what they do. Yeah. Um, at the it's it's weird, but some people you you won't even think about it. Um, they don't even know themselves that they have something to do in logistics. That's right. That's right. It's amazing that you say that because we have Freight Fest coming up in Houston, Texas, September 28th through October 1st. Okay, there so you go. So that is an amazing networking opportunity. So I'm glad you said that and not even prompted. Man, that was great. All right. Let's keep it. Let's keep it pushing on the interview. All right. So at what point did you get into the warehousing? I remember you told me we talked about the opportunity that you had with a customer who that was prior to this building, right? Oh, so yeah. So what point did the warehousing piece um, come into play? Yeah, it, it happened. Yeah. Three and a half, four years ago where I just got the opportunity. Um, my friend um, and, and partner needed just help. And I was like, I'll do it. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it was it was uh, it was fishing gear and these small little boxes. It was like over a thousand cartons on the floor. Um, and they just needed to cross dock. And I had, um, my dad actually always told me that he wanted to not only have a carrier side, but also, you know, get into warehousing. Um, but I was so overwhelmed with just running the carrier side that I never really saw myself venturing in anything else. Right. Um, but at the same time, I didn't want us to depend on just one flow of income. Um, I if if I always said like, oh, if if this is slow, we could do this. And if when this is slow, we could do that. 
Um, so I think it was really my dad who pushed me like, don't be scared. Just, you know, just learn. It's yeah. my dad. He thinks everything's <laughs> easy. Just go and learn. Right. Um, so he, he was like, he was kind of pushing me, like, just learn the industry, do it little by little. And, you know, we'll, we'll help, we'll see how we could, you know, get a facility soon. But if we have the opportunity to do it in the yard, let's just do it. Yeah. Like, why are you so scared of hard work? And then I was like, <laughs> I'm not scared of hard work. Challenging you. I know. Right. I'm very competitive. And he knows that. I think that he was pushing my buttons. Uh. Um, but I, that's how we started. We just, we, you know, I, I they started sending me one-offs here and there, and we would do them ourselves. We'd be sweating inside the container in summertime um, doing it. But if I think that if you're not out on the field with your people, you're never going to learn what it really feels like to get the job done. And to right. go back to the client and and tell them those rates that might seem expensive, but you're like, no, really, it really does take all this effort, um, you know, to get the job done. Right. You communicate it because you've been there. I've been there. And yeah. I feel like I've been there from the beginning. From when we started, I was dispatching. I was doing um, operations. I was doing accounting. Uh, even with the warehousing side, I'm the one inside the container, you know, moving the floor loads from one container to another. Um, so when you're really the one doing it, then you can really understand, you know, what it takes for 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 the rate to make sense and not only that for the job itself to make sense yeah yeah um so we we just started doing that and then um we decided during COVID time you talked about growth so i saw the opportunity to get clients in warehousing at the time because the demand was so high so we were looking for a warehouse in COVID times but we didn't want to commit to a uh, expensive lease yeah so I ended up, uh, my, my, um, my friend now, he, he, I met this guy, he, he was, uh, he's a real estate, I mean, a commercial real estate broker. He's my friend now because he's really cool. And I was like, look at him, I'm, I, this is my plan. I want to do this, but I cannot pay no $2 and some in warehousing. It just won't make sense to me in two, three years. Right. Can we find, so he's like, well, what do what do we try a sublease or, you know, maybe there's someone out there that's wait, it's they're ready to get into something bigger and they need to you to take over their lease uh, or something like that. Yeah. So we ended up finding a six month sublease um, here in Compton. Uh, uh, it was uh, 14,000 square feet of a where of warehouse um, and it had four docks. And that's really hard to find um, in in commercial property. Usually, the, if it's a small warehouse like that small, it's maybe one dock. Um, but we wanted to do transloading, which requires a lot of docks because that's what it is. It's just an in and out movement of the commodity. Um, so I remember we found it. The price was really good for the market. It was like amazing, and um, and we ended up getting it. Mm. So we got a six, um, you know, a six month sublease. And then my plan was to get to know the owner and then convince him to not charge me COVID prices <laughs> when it came for me to renew the, to like renew the lease or, you know, know what I was doing. Right. So I kind of rode that wave of getting transult clients because the demand was so high. And we ended up feeling I was I remember uh, walking into the warehouse and um looking at it and it looked huge it looked huge i was like how am i gonna fill this up i uh super scared to to this new thing that i wasn't really a pro at right um but i knew that the, the demand was there and that i had the connects to get me some work so i just had to kind of jump and, and swim you know type of scenario um and then two months after we, the warehouse was full Wow. So I still got to ride that, you know, very end of of the, the COVID wave. Um, and those clients are still with us now. Um, and because we kept, you know, growing, we didn't fit there anymore. So my plan was to grow there for three, four years and then see about getting a bigger space. But that happened a lot sooner than we thought because we, you know, we have accounts that are coming in fourth quarter that we needed the space for. And so we just moved to this new location, you know, like two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. 
that was extremely creative, number one, the sublease thing, right? Because not only you don't have to take on the entire leaf, you have somebody who doesn't need all their spaces. So it's like, let's sublet, and then you could use a little bit of the space and then grow a little bit slower. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. Um, how did you go about getting clients for, because you said you grew fast. So what, was this just demand and people were looking for warehousing space? Or were you actively pursuing these opportunities? Both. Um, what really helped was the demand. Um, what was happening, and when I say I rode the wave, was because there were so many containers not being able to be uh, off docked of the of the port. Then, when they did get, um, you know, off the vessel, you had or clients had um, 20, 30 containers to go into a warehouse that now was overfilled with space because the, the demand was so high that they didn't have any space for these um, transloads or even, you know, 3PL partners that you kind of, it's called FBA where you pick and pack their stuff um, and send it out through UPS or FedEx. Um, they didn't have space. So, and not only that, um, they had, you know, things that were going out of state that weren't getting there on time. So they had to reroute, you know what I mean? And, and transload at a facility and then take it onto a dry van because they were just trying to buy more time or more space or whether, whatever the scenario was. So I kind of took advantage of that. Um, and I had, you know, clients reaching out for space. And mm. then not only that, um, I, ha I was reaching out to people like, hey, I got space. You guys <laughs> need a space, I got space. Right. Um, so we, you know, we took advantage of that um, and, and gained clients you know, to to onboard with us for their warehousing needs. Got it. What were the biggest challenges getting started in, in the warehousing business for mm. you? I think it was learning the pricing. Mm. Um, if you don't know how to price something right, it that's going to determine your margins. And that's going to determine whether you have the money to pay for <laughs> rent and make profit. Right. Um, so I didn't want to quote wrong and then end up losing because I wasn't familiar with the pricing. So I think that was my biggest challenge um, because I had, um, so uh, Francisco, my warehouse manager, I've, knew, I've known him since I was in high school. So when I got the warehouse, I contacted him and I was like, hey, like, do you want, do you are looking for a new career, a new job? <laughs> um, and he was actually looking to changing companies at the time. So okay. I, I brought him in because he had over 10 years of, of warehouse knowledge of, ah. of how to, you know, transload, how to pick and pack. He knew, uh, you know, how to use the system, like a warehouse management system. It's called WMS system. Yep. So he knew all that. So he got us set up with everything. Um, so he was a, a, a big partner um, in setting us up for success with the warehouse. Yeah. The only thing he didn't know was sales. He Got knew it. everything operational and he, he knew everything. So that was a, the piece of the puzzle that I was missing in terms of rates. And I had to figure that on my own. Yeah. The, the setting it up is definitely an important piece. Yes. Um, so that was dope that you had a, a childhood friend out there yeah. to do that. How did you figure out the pricing though? Cause I, I mean, talk, talk about how that, how I'm not going to give that? my secrets away. <laughs> give us what you can give us. No, you know what? Um, I'm always honest. Okay, if I could do me. it, anybody can do it. Let's get it. Look, I got really creative. I made a fake email account. And um, I uh, there is this, uh, it's it's really useful. Um, it's called LoadMatch, this this uh, website, sorry. It's called LoadMatch, where you could put your, um, um, your company, if it's in logistics, so you... Uh, basically like a marketing thing. So if anybody's looking for a drayage company, they can find you there. It's kind of like the yellow pages for, for logistics. Yeah. Um, and they also have brokers there and they have um, shipper. No, actually they don't have shippers. They have um, freight forwarders and just a bunch of people that are in the industry. And they're also warehousing people there that can advertise their space there. So what I ended up doing is I created a fake email well, it was a real email, but it was a fake company name. <laughs> right. Um, and I went to Load Match, got a bunch of local warehouses in my area, and blasted them a, a like a, a quote. <laughs> right. I was like, 
hi, my name is, you know, I think I used like one of my sales guys. I was like, hi, my name is Luis. Um, <laughs> and Luis. I'm looking for <laughs> transloads and, you know, uh, and then they, and then I compared pricing around the market. Mm, got it. And where did you land in, in, in that? Um, I, I, I got different quotes, really high quotes, really low quotes and middle quotes. I just made it, I just did an average. I'm a, I'm a numbers person. So, um, I kind of got all the quotes together and did an average where I was still competitive, but I wasn't high and I wasn't low. Right. And after that, it was just about selling my services in terms of, we got great customer service. We're not expensive. You know what I mean? We have a great team, you know, adding all the fluff to it so you can, um, let your client know why you're charging the way you're charging. Right. And then you know all your fixed costs, of course, right? Yeah. So you can say, all right, does this make sense? Mm -hmm. And then you kind of figure it out from yes, there. Yes, exactly. Got it. All right. So at this point in the business, what, what, where, where are you, like, do they work together? Do you like one more than the other? Like, where, what direction are you headed in? The more trucking side or the more warehousing? Side? My goal is to, my goal is to be like a C.H. Robinson. Um, like, be the trucking, be the warehouse, and be the broker. Mm. Um, I want the broker side to um, to feed the drayage and warehouse side. Got it. I don't want to depend on brokers to get my work. Um, I want to work directly with shippers, which we already work with, you know, a few direct shippers and, and BCOs. Um, but I want to I, I want to kind of eliminate the the working with brokers. Got it. Not that I don't like to work with brokers, yeah. but you know that they're making something on top yeah. before they get to their client. And I also think that because we are in the industry, uh, that I'm in the industry of drayage and warehouse, when selling to an actual shipper, we can let them know what exactly to expect. And I feel like there's a, there was a surge of, of everybody becoming a broker. And when you would give them a quote, they wouldn't quote their client as you're quoting them. They would just shoot them the line haul and the fuel and um, and the chassis, for example. And then when it came time to, hey, you need to, you know, pre-pull this or you need to store this for a few days because of warehouse. And then they didn't quote that. And it's just like you set me up for failure. Now your client thinks that I'm overcharging or or I'm trying to take advantage you know, of the situation and trying to manipulate the situation to make more money. So you give the carrier a bad rep yeah. when you don't know what you're talking about. I remember I had a broker who got so upset at us um, because we had an 8 a.m. appointment at the terminal and we got stuck there for like six hours taking that container out because uh, there's a lot of uh, waiting time here in the Long Beach and L.A. ports. Yeah. Um, and the, the the broker called me. He's like, what do you mean six hours away? You had an appointment at 8 a.m. Like He really thought that I could just go in, be out in 30 minutes. Right. He didn't know how it works in there. Mm. And And when you don't have, again, when you're not on the field, you can't set your client up for good expectations. Um, and I feel like I learned that when I was working at T-Mobile, um, a lot of a lot of my my manager would be, would always be like, if the person's already inside, you already won fifty percent of the sale. The next part is, you know, to convince them to purchase whatever they they already want to purchase. Right. But a lot of my teammates would, you know, say, yeah, you can get, you know, because they they give you like as a salesperson, they would tell you you have to um, sell them the case and the and the screen protector and the phone and you Upset. can bundle it up with accessories yeah. and stuff like that. And so my, my teammates would get creative and be like, yeah, you're not paying for that. And like they would add the cost to to the to the total. Right. right. Um, but when they would get their bill, they would come to the store. And if that salesperson was off, you'd have to deal with someone else's BS. That's right. And oh, this person told me that they weren't charging me for the case and they were charging me for this. And look, it's, it's here now. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, the, the, you know, like, why would you? <laughs> why would you do that? Why would you do that? Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and so you're not setting up your client to have good expectations or great expectations or what to expect. Um, I remember there was this also this like um, charge that if you were if you buy a new phone before your your cycle your um, billing cycle is over, they would charge you this probation charge. Yeah, and um, 
And the when I learned about it, I would have people come in trying to, you know, buy a phone and I would send them away. I'd be like, look, dude, you're going to get charged this and this and that. You're two weeks away from your your um your billing cycle to be renewed. Just come back to me and I'll make sure that everything gets done correctly. Mm. And then I'd write them down on my little notepad and I'd call them like three days before and and they'd come. And then I wouldn't have a, a, an angry client. I would have a client refer me to someone else and then they'd come and buy a phone from me. That's right. Because your trans your transparency and honesty, people feel that. People feel when you're being kind of, you know <laughs> what I mean? shifty. Kind of shifty. <laughs> but when you're being honest and transparent, your client feels that. And I feel like that's something that we've always wanted to do in in this, um, in the, I, at least me. I, 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 I've always wanted to be honest and transparent because I never wanted my business to get a bad rep or, or anything like that people wouldn't want to work with you. Yeah. So when it came to, 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 to all that, all the rates, like I already knew what it you know what it cost to do it um and to have that power and work directly with a shipper that can that you can tell them like hey i know how this works uh and i could guarantee you that your container is not going to be there tomorrow but it can be there on friday right you're already setting them up for for good expectations so your company is not going to you know come out losing at the end and i feel like Brokers miss that sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Where they're just worried about getting the work done and they don't talk about, well, how, what does it take to get it done? Yeah, no doubt. Talk to me about how things are now in comparison to, you know, when things are more stable. Uh, and I'm, I'm not saying things are stable for you now, but because you know, I know there's a lot of volatility in the market right now. I'm right? going to be honest. They're so, not stable. You know what I mean? Um, not in not in uh, terms where, where, you know, we're freaking out, but it's just it's just been so up and down. Yeah. Uh, where you have a really good, you know, good month in high sales and, 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 a, and a bad month where you just didn't hit the mark. Um, and it has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with with the market. Um, so de definitely things have changed. But I mean, that's why you prepare. You know, you have, um, you know, money to survive X amount of time of, you know, bad sales, for example. So I feel like we've been really blessed to kind of put, you know, just one foot in front of the other so we don't overcommit. And when things like this do happen, we're, you know, ready for them. And we're, we're just trying to make it until next year, until things get, you know, set up. Yeah. And the crazy thing is that I've, I've had growth even in this really low time. Really? Um, just because, it, and it might not be financial what growth. Yeah, what is growth? It, it might not be financial growth, but it has been um, business growth. Mm. Um where I've gained new partnerships, um, where I've made the commitment for a bigger warehouse. And people are like, why did you, you know, commit to a bigger warehouse where the market's not not there? But the thing about this market is it makes you work harder in the sense of, OK, the demand is not there anymore. Now you got to pick up the phone and make 100 calls a day That's right. to survive. And it, within those 100 calls a day, you find a partner that's ready to commit to you for the whole year. Um, because now you could play with pricing. You know what I mean? Now it's about all the client cares about is, hey, he gave me a low rate over here. I might not give you a low rate, but we could set you up so you're not switching carriers every quarter because, you know, the rates are higher, the rates are low. Let's just talk about a rate for the whole year. And go from there. Yeah. So you start setting, you start getting creative with how you're, you know, how you're pitching. Um, because in COVID times, yeah, there was a lot of work, but there was a lot of random work. Because everybody needed help. <laughs> right, right. But um, when it's, you know, a normal business cycle, you know that you can't survive without a true partnership. Yeah. And someone that's going to give you steady work and you're going to give them steady service got it what what was it like for you when you guys um crossed over a million dollars in revenue oh what what was that feeling for you it was a great feeling because i remember when we came in we were doing like ten thousand dollars <laughs> in sales and i had like two dollars for myself <laughs> and i was like where's all the money you yeah, know what i mean yeah. um 
You know, I heard trucking has a lot of money in it. <laughs> it doesn't. We're like, it, it, I always tell everybody from the food pyramid, the carriers are like the last ones um, to profit eat. Because brokers will tell you, well, you guys take most of the most of the chunk of, of what we charge. And shippers are going to tell you, well, yeah, we pay you for everything you do. But um, people miss that you got to buy your own truck. You got to buy your own diesel. You need a yard. You need um, a mechanic. You need e equipment. You need to pay fees at the terminal to get the container out. You need to pay your driver. You need to pay a dispatcher, an accounting person. Like there's the expense list is crazy. It's crazy. Versus a broker, they're just going to make you know that middle money and be done with it yeah and pay for <laughs> wi-fi <laughs> you know what i mean sorry brokers we, we love we you. love yeah we love yeah we do we do we but do. um but uh, what i'm saying is the overhead to be a carrier it's a lot of money yeah it's a lot of money so um when we and and i always had i always have personal goals where i was like this year we're gonna get to five hundred thousand sales you know what I mean? This year, we're going to get to this amount. This year, we're going to get to that amount. And um, our first time that we got to that was in, I think it was like in 2017. Okay. Yeah. So 500 to the million. To the million. Okay. Got it. And I was like, oh, <laughs> this is awesome. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. In terms of like getting there, because just because, because nowadays a million isn't nothing. This is true. You know what I mean? Inflation. I, inflation. Have changed. Has, everything has changed. So <laughs> like a million dollars, is, you know, it's not what it used to be. Um, but it definitely doesn't take away from the hard work. Yeah. And and everything that you have to sacrifice in order to get to another level that 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 you want to get to, because it is a commitment. Like you got to commit. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people don't um, don't talk about that. They, they, everybody always just flexes. I got, <laughs> I got this and I got that. You know what I mean? And, um, but it doesn't matter at what level your company is, um, whether it's at a smaller scale like mine or even smaller than, than me or even bigger than me. Yeah. The sacrifice, the sacrifices are all the same. Um, because you're always going to have growing pains. If you're like me that I'm not complacent. Like I want more and I want more and I want more. Um, and my, that might be a problem. I don't know. <laughs> Talk to my therapist later. Um, but, um, but I'm such a competitor that, you know, I'm always challenging myself and the growing pains are real. They're, um, they keep you up at night. You know what I mean? There were, if, if, if I'm not worried about, oh, there's not enough work, you know, I'm worried like, oh, I don't want to lay off people. Like this is my team. You That's know right. what I mean? Um, these people have families. These people got kids. Um, so it's always a constant thing in your head that doesn't let you, you know, breathe like other people, I feel. Yeah. Um, but when, when you finally get a win, it just, it's just, you know, you feel like Kobe Bryant when he went like this, <laughs> you know, Black got Mamba. on top of everything. <laughs> um, Mamba. you know what I mean? And then you start all over again. The yeah. challenge starts all over again. Yeah. But I, I recently read something where it, where it said, um, that like a baby lobster when it when it when it's growing it it has to go through this it has to go through physical pain and it has to basically break out of his original shell and it goes through this tremendous pain and pressure and stress and it's not until it's enough pain and stress and pressure that it breaks and a new one can grow mm. So uh, I always go back to that little that little story. I'm like, right now I'm in growing pains. I just got this, you know, bigger warehouse, and you know, we 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 need to acquire, you know, more warehouse clients, and we're in this era of the trucking business not doing so well. But I'm not scared. You know what I mean? I'm more scared of not trying. That's right. Um, and I rather you know fail at this than just wake up every day and be complacent. And sometimes I think about it, I'm like, dude, I could be working at C.H. Robinson, C.H. Robinson, nine to five, be a pro there, be a rock star, because I know so much. <laughs> True. You know what I mean? Um, but that's not what I want at the end. Yeah. You know, I, I, it's it's worth all the ache, aches and pains. Um, but you do have to have a strong mentality for it. Got it. Definitely. Are, are you able to share your current revenue or your highest grossing year? Yeah. Um, right now we're grossing about 
I want to say we're in about last year 25. 25? Mm -hmm. Got it. And how many trucks are you guys currently running? We're running about, we're running right now 40 trucks and then we have owner operators as well. Got it. Okay. Okay, cool. Talk to me about the future, man. What are, I mean, you obviously have a very ambitious goals. What, what else is on your roadmap um, for, for Jasmine? And where, where's dad at? Because where, where, you haven't talked about him. Where's, where's... My dad is probably under a truck greasing it up. <laughs> <laughs> really? You know, I had a feeling you were going to say that. Um, I have a funny story real quick. Okay, okay. So okay. we hired this uh, new driver um, and he, he mainly works from the yard. That's his, that's his space. That's what he does. So Got we it. all contribute. At some part, I have my, my my little sister. She she runs accounting for me. Um, my mom, she'll come and clean for us and stock up the fridge and, you know, very mom momly vibes. Um, and my dad runs everything um, vehicle maintenance wise and, and the yard. Um, so we hired this new driver and, um, you know, we, we always tell him, OK, meet at the yard. You're going to have um, your whole spill like this is this is the truck and, you know, this is uh, how we run things. This is what we expect. Onboarding. Yep. There you go. And um, so that time I was running. No, Chris, my operation, he was running late. And he's like, you know what? Um, there's going to be this guy that's going to give you. He just told him because he didn't know how to like tell him who he was. He's like, he's going to be this guy that ha that's wearing like a blue shirt. That's going to give you the keys to the truck. And they're, they're going to go fill it up, fill it up with diesel with you or whatever. So my dad hops in and he's all greasy because... That's what he does. He works on the <laughs> trucks and they're driving to the diesel pump. And he's like, this company's owned by 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 Koreans, I think he said, huh? And he's like, he's like, my dad's like, mm, no. <laughs> and then he's like, he's like, he's like, oh, I thought so, because those Koreans, they be taking your money like crazy. <laughs> and I'm like, my dad's like, OK. And he's like, I, he's like, is this this company that do they take all your money and they leave you high and dry? Right. Never pay the drivers. And he's like, and my dad's like, no, like, you'll like it. You'll like it. It's a it's a cool company to work with. Right. And then he's like, how long have you been here with the company? My dad's like, oh, almost eight years. And then and then he's like talking mad like. <laughs> <laughs> about about you know like you know the company and everything yeah, else yeah. and then like a few weeks later i think chris calls the guy back and he's like they call him el patron which in english means like the boss the boss that's right yeah and he's like he he tells him hey you know go go get this from el patron go get this from the boss and then he's like who's the boss the guy da, da, da. and then he's like he's the boss <laughs> <laughs> Like <laughs> nobody ever knows my dad's the oh, owner. That is funny. That because is funny. he's just, you know, he's yeah. just a regular guy. And he Undercover never, boss yeah, in he real never life. tells anybody either. He right. He just goes he, along and plays just, the game. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. They're okay. They they do good work, I guess, you know. <laughs> that's yeah. great. So that's, that's where great. my dad is at. He's probably at the yard taking care of something. Because oh, something's always breaking down in a truck. Um got it. But yeah, he's he's there. I love it. I love it. Goals. We were talking about goals for 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 you, personal goals and uh, personal goals, goals and professional goals. Yeah, for I think yep. I think for Jaspum, right now my main goal is I feel like in the carrier side we're already established and we're growing little by little. Um, we have a strong foundation there. I think my my challenge right now is the warehouse and trying to set that up um, so that we're successful in that new. Um, venture mm. and and eventually adding that broker side that i was telling you so maybe i don't know who knows maybe in five years from now we'll be you know very well established in the warehousing business um but as of for the end of this year i just want to make sure that we grow the warehousing side even if it's little by little um i'm okay with small steps towards you know, big goal. bigger goals. Yeah. Uh, and I think personally for me, I think that I'm in a time in my life where I love Jaspum. It's my baby. But I think I, I'm ready to kind of delegate more. I was telling you that earlier. I, I've found it hard to, you know, kind of let go, let go and disappear <laughs> for a while because yeah. clients will always want to talk to me and, you know, handle mm. things with me. But um, but I'm learning how to delegate more just so I have more breathing time that's right yeah got it jasper where'd that name come from i don't think we asked that yeah my my dad came up with that um it's it's all of our initials in one in one name ah, so jose okay. which is the j that's my dad amilcar is my my brother um stephanie it's all our middle names stephanie that's me i'm bianca stephanie 
Um, P is Paola, my little sister who takes care of accounting. Elizabeth, the other little sister I have. And then Marita is my mom. Got it. That's dope. Yeah, I'm glad so, I asked that question. Yeah, so so is everybody working in the business or is there anybody else that's, that's um, not? Except the little one. Okay. Um, Kiora, uh, she's only 13. Ah, uh, she's old enough. But we make her pick up. <laughs> we make her pick up trash and wash the dishes over there. <laughs> right, right, right. She can do something. She can do something. But she's prime. She'll be. Yeah, she'll, she'll be joining she'll be. very, 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 soon. very soon. So yeah, everybody holds uh, some type of um, responsibility here. Yeah, which is great. Um, sometimes it could be you know messy working with family, but I think that because we all have a similar goal, um, in 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 terms of um, my dad always said, look. Yes, we're doing this to put our family into a different, you know, financial um, goals. But look at all the people we employ. So he's always he's always thinking about, like, how can we add more people to the team? Yeah. And I think that um, that kind of stuck to me and which is why I always think about my team and, and everything that they bring to the table and all the efforts they put because um, they don't have to be here. They could choose to work anywhere else. That's right. Um, and uh, and he's always been um, very clear that if we ever fought about money, he's dissolving the company and giving it away. <laughs> <laughs> he literally said that. I believe him, too. Um, I believe him. But he said to like to not lose focus of why we're doing this. And that's to bless everyone that we encounter. Wow. Um, so we we try to really, you know, stick to that because the last thing we want to do is is lose our, our path and start making decisions out of greediness or just out of, you know, like there has to be a purpose to the choices we're making. Yeah. Well, I'm glad he gave it one more shot, man. Yeah, you right? Know, imagine if he would have quit after the other two times, I know. right? He always tells me that. He's like, if this doesn't work out, we'll just do another company. I'm like. <laughs> he must be an amazing guy, man. He sounds he like is. a really, really good guy. He really is. For sure. All right. So I think uh, I think we've told the story. I think we're going to wrap. We've been like an hour and a half so far. We've been going. You guys know I me talk, already. I talk to you all day, <laughs> for sure. Uh, but traditionally, uh, we have to, before we go, number one, let everybody know where they can connect with you personally, like wherever social media is your strongest, where you're at. And then lastly, we got to give a final thought for the audience. Just anything you want to leave people with, whether it's a spiritual, entrepreneurial, just a final jewel. Okay. for everybody so first where can they learn more about you and learn more about jasper trucking so if you're into insta <laughs> if you're into that kind of thing um we have a instagram jasper truck line um but we also have a website where it tells you everything all the services we do that's jaspintruckline.com uh and you can always find me on linkedin uh, which is a great platform for networking um <laughs> but if i had to leave a thought I guess it's uh, never give up um, one foot in front of the other. Um, there is this uh, person, I can't remember his name in National Geograph Geography, that he's a bird watcher. And um, I think he, uh, that year, he documented like thousands and thousands of birds. And, he, and someone asked him, like, how did you, you know, how did you do that? How did you, how did you, find so many birds within one year because i guess in that industry it's just it's not easy right um and he said bird by bird so i think that if you're in a situation of leadership or in a situation where people are looking at you for guidance and you just get all that you know anxiety that sometimes business owners get that they don't know what's going to happen the next day or the next year um, and I think especially in these in these trying times where inflation is what it is, the trucking industry is what it is. Um, what I do is bird by bird, step by step. I don't try to cloud my minds with a lot of things that I shouldn't be worried about at the time. I just do one task at a time. And that's how I, I feel like anybody could, you know, just survive mentally. Man, I love that. Bird by bird. Hustle fam, if you don't respect that, your whole perspective is whack. This has been a really enlightening episode. I'm so glad I came here, got to learn more about you, Bianca, and your business, Jazz from Truck Lines. Um, man, I guess I guess that's a wrap. You know what we do around this time, guys. If you smell something burning, it's only a desire, myself and Miss Bianca. Um, let me try to get this last name right one more time. Cayenche? Calanche. 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 We are out. 
If you twisted, confused, or stuck about trucks, don't be dumb. This is the place to come. Truck and hustle. Let's go.